What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and once again in 2018, it's going to be my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Today, we're taking to the skies, wrapping a scarf around our necks, fueling up the hogs of war, and taking on enemies in a variety of once celebrated death machines in a battle of wits, fortitude, and just a little bit of luck. It's not American Gladiators the Remaster, no, it's Flying Tigers, Shadow of China, which is an air combat action game that's supposedly based on the true events of secret volunteer squadrons that defended China against Japan in the China-Burma-India theater of war in World War II. Let's see how an air combat game that throws you into battles with up to 15 other people in multiplayer or 15 questionably trained bots in various single player modes does, shall we? And Tigers is coming out January 11th exclusive to Xbox systems and is already on the PC for $19.99. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Flying Tigers Shadows Over China, Gran Turismo 5 No Dash Airplane Edition. In World War II, the ground was the hard deck and the many hazards of going zero miles per hour in an airplane. And of course, graphics are up first. So let's get this actually out of the way. It was interesting to see a game, even with a somewhat basic landscape such you bomb blast and bail out over, have an actual good draw-in system. You know what I'm talking about, the popped-in sup mountains we've seen in other titles where it's like someone randomly realized, oh crap, we need to sketch in this crap before an unnamed protagonist does a soul high five by smashing into Mount Surprise. It's not perfect, but it's a damn sight better than we've seen in other games and many of them not actually being budget. In fact, there's just a surprisingly small amount, no matter if you're over nighttime cities or racing down the center of a ravine at around crazy plus 25 miles per hour. Also, I have to say the overall look of most of the planes is done well, and there is a bevy of more unique ones here with the P-80 shooting star to the Vildebeest MK3, even to the hold on to your butts, this thing is just going to fly apart Divine Dragon from Japanese Air Force, which saw about as much action as all of us did in middle school, meaning absolutely none. Explosions and weapons fire and hits do what they need to do and inform you of damage, and the far-off puff of engine misfires can be the magic between following enemy at breakneck speed to finish them off or turning and engaging someone else nearby. There is something just absolutely cool about firing off rounds into the sky and seeing that telltale pop of death smoke. When it's running on all cylinders, Tigers is actually a pretty capable looking arcade title, especially at this budget price. Unfortunately, that's not as often as we would probably all like. First off, many of the planes just don't have in-play cockpits at all, reminding us of the hilarious and apparently amazing idea that Gran Turismo 5 had when it decided, you know what, let's make people pay for premium dashes, except here replace basic with nothing and premium with the basic energy would actually expect. Sadly, less than 50% seem to have cockpits, and since the game came out on PC in like early 2017 and people have been asking for more cockpits on the PC version since then, I doubt we're magically going to see more support on this version. Now that doesn't mean the other views are useless, they're not. You have your near, far, and super close view of the airplanes, and of course you can swivel around using the thumb pad. But to me, the loss is the sense of immersion if you don't have cockpits, even generic ones, because turning an enemy plane into the world's first flying spaghetti strainer with a well-placed 200 shot barrage into their fuselage, or transforming best friends into wingless crater makers is far less enjoyable when you're not able to, you know, be in the actual airplane. Also, the game has a nasty yellow debug that crops up more in cockpit mode, funny enough, than the exterior mode, which causes some of the trees to end up flashing in and out. Now, it's strange. Since the pop-in is actually kept to a minimum, those flashes detract even more from what could have been a strong point of the title. There is some silver lining to these skies filled with lead, though, and that is the frame rate. It actually sticks fairly close to 60 FPS, and there are some excellent moments like tracking an enemy as they take a dirt nap below you or flying head-to-head -head with an enemy and just barely flitting by me. I guess in closing, I'd say this. At this price, you absolutely have to put your expectations in check. You have to understand what budget elements are, that's for sure. But the lack of cockpits, to me, isn't as much a budget mishap as it is a sign of the things that Tigers has wrong with it. And that is that at many times, it doesn't seem to really know what it wants to offer. Overall, though, I'd say this. It's nice to see some of these elements in a flying game on the console, arcade or not, and at times a lack of pop-in in some maps is actually quite impressive. But those positives are held back by a number of issues. Sound, music, and voice. And you know what? Let's do music first. It's actually hit and miss. Listen, at one point, it's the tried and true horns and thunder of old patriotic music, which is fine and makes you think of folks hacksaw Jim Duglin their way into battle with nothing but a thumbs up and a flag draped over them for armor. 
But then randomly, you mix that in with a generic thundering heavy metal soundtrack in game, and you get this entirely discordant affair. It'd be a bit like showing up for a Slayer concert and friggin' Steve Martin plugs in an electric banjo and opens for him. Sure, separately they might sound good, but that's an odd mix. It just doesn't work, and worse yet, it brings attention to the differences we see in various other elements in the game and makes them all the more noticeable. You can turn it off though, which is always good. I would say this, it's not bad, it's just overly generic and in many ways a little bit more cumbersome than it actually needs to and doesn't really add to the atmosphere. And that of course brings us to sound. First, bravo to them for at least having various different gun sounds for the different calibers some of these planes took into battle. It's nice to jump into one and hear what can only be described as a bunch of friggin' handguns duct taped together and then riveted the outside of the plane and called a weapon. Or leap into another and you hear the heavy caliber booms as you send please die messages through the air to your enemies. The issue is, even with a ton of settings adjustments, they never really mixed right. They never sound like they were really coming from inside or connected to the plane. And that's in airplanes that, you know, have cockpits. They feel off and almost completely anemic. There is a difference between turning the sound up and turning the volume up. One carries information, the other doesn't. And sadly, a lot of times, it doesn't hear. It just doesn't thunder. Listen, you are firing off bullets from rifles strapped to the friggin' fuselage. That sense of violence and almost loud frustration that should be there is not. Now you can adjust the sound effects and I suggest you do, but it's never really going to be that good. Explosions and so forth sound fine and hit impacts on your own plane are okay to average. And of course that brings us to voice. Now first I have to say this, almost everything's voiced and hats off to these guys for doing both that and also making sure that at the very least, for the most part, every voice sounds like it was actually, you know, in the game versus someone at their desk recording it and just being injected later. And you even have various elements of slang used during those times in the different cutscenes or alerts. That really should be applauded and shows a level of attention that doesn't really exist in many games, but dear God, the accents. Some of these fake accents are just insane and as over the top as you could possibly be. They're far more caricatures than they are characterizations and that's something you should be prepared for because wow, it can be physically daunting to hear at times. And of course that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. And the story is you're basically one of these secret volunteers and you play more in the location than as specific persons. For the most part, you're bouncing around from cockpit to cockpit in a variety of missions, everything from dive bombing to taking out enemy searchlights on surface vessels to strafing troops, most likely just probably trying to get in from the cold. Through it all and across the various different modes, you have 20 plus aircraft. Modes are pretty much as expected, with multiplayer offering hosting or joining battles with up to 16 people dogfighting against everyone else. You have team, deathmatch, and a couple other unique modes. Now in single player, you've got a game that's probably four to six hours, depending on the skill you choose, how good you are, and various other factors, where dogfight is a battle against bots across any of the locations in the game, as well as setting your own weather effects and difficulties. Challenge is a lot like dogfights, but with some small goals or objectives within them, just like living as long as you can or taking out a series of enemies in a time limit. Of course, all this has leaderboards. Free flight is pretty much what it sounds like and allows you to choose from any of the available aircraft and just fly around the landscapes. And of course, the lowest common denominator for all these modes, how it controls. And it's a bit like holding hands with your parents after you're out of the first grade. It's a little bit awkward. First, the good. Even in arcade, when you're against others, it can feel pretty good. And you can swoop down on some wingmen and take them out and send them to the great beyond using various different gadgets. FYI, most gadgets just explode in different ways. But when dogfighting against, say, the AI, which is the campaign, the game loses a great deal of its finesse. You see, the enemies aren't using arcade. They're using their own flight model, and especially in campaign or in other AI areas, it can feel all kinds of wonky with you controlling one way, but watching the airplanes, they control a different way. Now, when you switch to advanced, you have the rudder set to the bumpers on your Xbox controller, which as we all know, aren't analog, which also means you need to set its sensitivity as the default setting could be kindly termed as nope. Luckily on the expert mode, you can go in and adjust a ton of the settings. The problem is a controller has a very limited series of inputs and unlike say Elite Dangerous, which allows for multi-press commands, this game doesn't seem to. Why not have guns and missiles be hot swappable in some way on the same button, freeing up another for one of the various other things you may find yourself needing to do in the game at any one point. Also the guns auto target a bit, but it takes hundreds of bullets to kill almost anyone in the game. And you have the guns overheating too, which means a good deal of the battles break down to you firing a series of what looks to be ineffectual bullets towards an enemy and then hearing the guns sputter and die, only to fire the moment they're ready again, but the bullets hit the enemy's wingman, who is nearby. And I get it, some of this to extend the actual gameplay, but peppering someone's rear end with an inordinate, almost unbelievable amount of ordnance seems more in line with a red tube video than a video game, even one like this that's an arcade title. The guns have gone through one balancing effort prior on the PC, let's hope for another. And let's talk for a second about the campaign itself. One second, you're doing the dirty with Japanese zeros, just absolutely fighting tooth and nail to stop them from getting behind you. And they actually do a fairly passable job there. 
the next you're jumping into a bomber to drop a single bomb, then to another plane to take a picture, and then another to do something else. The breadth here of the title is great, but it also hurts it just a little bit. For example, bombing in the larger aircraft, it doesn't actually mean you're going to be able to jump into the bombing seat and the plane is going to do anything other than crater because you are now both the pilot and the bomber. Now, this isn't like the smaller ones where you can just sort of look down and sight in. This is where you are basically restricted to a small window to look through and you actually need to control the plane. You need to evade enemies. You need to drop the bomb. And it just seems like it is a little bit messy there. It's not impossible. It's just that instead of the game auto leveling the plane or something like that, it keeps all that movement mapped and it just doesn't feel right. Now, that being said, the AI did hunt me down and on the harder difficulties was indeed a challenge. So there is that. And of course, that brings us to fun factor. And I have to say this, first of all, zero bugs. Now, that's funny because I can barely remember almost any title that's given me zero bugs. It doesn't mean you won't experience them. It just means I didn't in my playthrough. Overall, there's some really cool offerings here. Multiplayer and dogfight had some real fun. Campaign was OK, but the frequent invasion of the Body Snatchers gameplay and leaping from plane to plane really hurt it if those planes just weren't that fun to be in. You know, the entire time I spent with Tigers, I felt like the game really didn't exactly know what it wanted to offer. It's got some cockpits, but not all. Somewhat good controls, but limited on rebinding to simple presses. And while it's got a fairly laid back approach to its air flight dynamics and hot seating from plane to plane can and cannot be a blast, it still felt a little bit more hit and miss than I expected. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, never touch it again rating scale with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC titles. Now, this is the console version of it, and I would say this is wait for a deep, deep sale. If you could get this for maybe five to nine bucks, it might actually be worth your time. It is a bit unbalanced in its offerings, but that is different than bad. And once again, it is budget. Its price does help it. In a deep, deep sale, you're looking at maybe 25%, maybe 50% of its price picking this up. It is a genre that's underrepresented on the consoles as well. And so that makes it something that might end up catching your eye a little bit. The only thing I would say is, of course, you have an issue where multiplayer may not be as robust if those server numbers aren't high. So that's it for me. I hope you liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Maybe check out Twitter or Reddit. And as always, I've got a Patreon. If you want to continue to see these reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap that cover every element of a title, then you can go ahead and jump on there and support the channel. It keeps these videos coming. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.